It's a heck of a way to end my first year. Yeah, <laughs> going out with a bang. That sucker is just really weird. Facebook wants me to share my, my birding show with supernova enthusiasts. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> Super cool. Super cool, huh? I guess. Yeah. I've tried your link four or five times. It just doesn't, doesn't, want, doesn't connect. Doesn't want to do it. Huh? I like the Facebook bird misidentification page. Um, I only see the eagle. You only see the eagle? I, see, I Well, first of all, I don't have, I'm only looking at his, what his presentation is that he sent yesterday. Oh, as far as Ken? Oh, sure. Yeah. So I don't see anything else. So that's okay. Understood. Understood. Have you ever misidentified a bird, Dan? Nobody ever checks me. <laughs> <laughs> so you're always right. <laughs> it's the thing, the thing, weird thing about being a birder uh, is that you will, I, I swear you'll never take credit for something if you're not 100% sure. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure that's part of the hobby. Yeah. Honesty. It would also be the same for astronomers too. I mean, they're not, they're not going to call something a particular star or nebula or whatever, unless they know for sure. Unfortunately, it's not the same for fishermen. <laughs> <laughs> Scotty, you're on top of things today. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Holy crap. It was this big. Mm-hmm. Well, who do we have? We got Pekka, Hautala on, Harold Locke. And that's it right now. Howdy or Woody Woodpecker would say, hey, 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 hey. hey. <laughs> <laughs> It sounds more like the penguin laughing on Batman. Uh, Harold Locke says, howdy, terrific Thursday. I think we're ready to get started here. Here we go. Thank you. Take, for example, the noble peacock. It's one of the most beautiful birds, with nearly every color under the sun. But that five-foot-long tail is also totally impractical. More of a hindrance than a help when fleeing from predators such as tigers. So why have a tail to die for? 
If the male can survive despite being handicapped by handsomeness, he's likely to be seen as hyper-healthy. A trait any prospective mother would want to pass on to her children. The whole point of this dandy's dance is for the male to advertise his gorgeousness. Among peacocks, the good-looking guy always gets the girl. Well, hello everybody. This is Scott Roberts and Kent Martz uh, with um, with uh, Dan George and Annie Scarborough uh, today, uh, but but Dan is behind the scenes right now. He he was unable for some reason to log on to Zoom, which was kind of strange. But uh, uh, nevertheless, uh, we've got him on phone, and he's right next to my microphone here, and he'll be able to hear uh, you know uh, uh, Kent and and Annie and myself, and uh, be able to talk to you. So. Uh, We've got, uh, uh, so far we have uh, Pekka Hautala, uh, Harold Locke, um, we've got Norm Hughes watching and uh, other people that uh, might not be chatting right now. So anyhow, uh, good to see all of you. Uh, we're on our 20th episode of On the Wing and um, uh, the uh, subject is colorful birds, but uh, we're going to, uh, uh, Tune in to Annie right now. Uh, what do you got for us, Annie? Um, I just kind of wanted to highlight our our shows over the next week or next couple of weeks. I'm just going to be kind of highlighting our shows and um, and the hosts of those shows. So I wanted to kind of start off with uh, Mr. Kent Martz here. Um, and so I'm going to share a screen real fast. Let's get Kent's reaction here. Yes. Let's do it. <laughs> oh, that's the reaction. <laughs> He's like, great. Your face is really red, Kent. My face is always red. It's hot in here. Oh, yeah. And, and when I'm outside all weekend long, you know, wind and sun. <laughs> so we're going to talk about First Light Chronicles. Um, uh, Kent obviously is the host of First Light Chronicles. It airs every uh, Wednesday uh, about 4.15 to 5. Um, you know, it, it offers insight and methods to get started in amateur astronomy, as well as to be a platform to discuss topics of interest to am amateur astronomers. And it is now on its 57th episode as of yesterday. So we're coming up on the 58th. Um, so I kind of asked Ken a couple of questions this week, just trying to figure out a little bit of background. We're not going to go into depth on, you know, all the way back from the time he was born till now, but we're, uh, you know, he has been hosting first like Chronicles, uh, since the beginning. Um, and it was kind of neat to go back and kind of uh, look at the videos, um, from like number one till now, it was just really interesting to see all that and how y'all, um, and how how you and Scott, how Kent and Scott um, made it through the uh, pandemic. Um, I think there was, yeah, it was, there was actually an episode that I saw that y'all were sitting um, in the showroom with masks on and. Um, oh, right. Yeah. 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 So that was, that was real. that was really interesting. So uh, yeah. So, uh, but uh, he has been involved in amateur astronomy his whole life. Uh, thanks to his dad. Um, he has been a member of a local astronomy club for 20 years and has served as a uh, president twice, which he currently still is the president, I believe. Is that right, Kent? Two more months. And, yeah. And he's also now a founding member of, member of the club, and he um, still worked diligently to do outreach in his community. Um, I asked him if what he loved most, and he said if he had, you know, if he had to pick one thing he loved most about astronomy would be vis visual outreach. Um, he really likes giving others the opportunity to experience seeing through a telescope for the first time. Um, and he has been on staff with Explore Scientific for three years. Uh, he started off as a customer service rep and is now the dealer's manager. So, um, but I thought it would be kind of fun as I went through those shows to kind of, it's hard to get pictures from shows. So 
the quality is not great, but <laughs> yes, but they're pretty amazing photos. So yes, he has offered so much versatility, fun, and a wealth of knowledge to First Light Chronicles. He has brought stem cell research right here, toys, mm -hmm. stem toys showing how to get children involved in nature. And wait, wait, showed, wait, 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 not stem, stem cell. I oh, stem. stem. Thank, not thank you. Stem cell. Thank you are correct. Thank we you. don't do See, stem cell research. A wealth of knowledge. See, that he corrects me. <laughs> Yes. No, this is a nature habitat. See, oh, and you've true. got see, and you've oh, got the little, you've got the leaves and stuff. And so he, you know, he's great about showing us, showing us those things and how they work. Um, he has also shown us a backpack that can carry a telescope. Yeah. Which was pretty amazing, which we still have. And he has also shared his beloved Mickey with us from his home. My daughter's home where I live right now. Oh, yeah. yeah. So there you go. So that is Kent. I have, I just have a couple of questions, Kent, about three. If so you, you can see, hang on. So back, just over my shoulder, that one picture, that's okay. the bedroom I actually grew up in because we're, we're working on building a new house. And so that picture over my this shoulder one? there, yeah, you just right there, right over my right ear. Oh yeah, uh, it's is not sitting on top of the stereo? Uh, no, it's, it's right over my left, right shoulder. That's my, uh, up to that little picture frame. By the window. Oh, yeah, that right there, right, right there. That's a picture of the space shuttle sitting on the launch pad. And I, really? Yeah, it's very cool. That is really cool. That yeah. is really cool. I need cool. to bring it down here and hang it in my office. You should. So, that would yeah. be pretty amazing to see. So, yeah. um, so okay, I just have a I just have three questions for you. Okay. So if you had one life changing memory what to do with astronomy, what beer. would you say would it be? No, beer. not here. <laughs> Oh, clearly the eclipse. I mean, it, it, when you see, you know, I've seen, you know, a 90 or 85 percent eclipse. And it's cool. You know, you project it on the ground. You see the shadows in the trees are, are, are eclipses and, you know, eclipse glasses. And yeah, but that that moment when it goes and, and the way I've described this and I've you heard me say it before, potential on the shows is people ask me, you know, what it was like. And I'll say. Well, 95% humidity is an ice cube that's been in a deep freezer. 99% is, is that ice cube having been out of the deep freezer for two minutes. And totality is that ice cube boiling water. The difference between 99%, which is sort of weird light, but still not. And all of a sudden, it's just like, bam, that emotion immediately is overwhelming and, and, and very humbling. It's astoundingly cool, and it most assuredly is an addictive drug that makes you want to go do that again and sell whatever it is you have to sell to go do it. I can see how people that can afford it literally go to every total eclipse. I'm looking forward to seeing the 2023 annular eclipse down in South Texas, followed by the 2024 total eclipse down in South Texas. But if you've never seen a total eclipse, you need to make plans now to be the farther south you can get, the better you're going to get based on statistical cloud analysis. But you need to see a total eclipse. It, it truly is a wondrous experience. Yeah. Like okay. Yeah, it so, really is. Yeah, well, I'm sure it's undescribable until you finally actually go see it. I'm, I, I'm sure it's one of those things that you don't even understand until you've you, actually seen it you hear stories about people who drag their spouses or or typically it's the man that drags their wife to a to an eclipse Drags. and um during the eclipse they ask where's the next one because we're going you know it it's it, it's that kind of of altering perceptions so yeah. all right that's question number one okay so um what would you say your favorite telescope is Beer. Oh, clear telescope. Uh, the one I'm using now. Okay, so what is that? What do you currently use? Well, I'm not using one right now, but whichever telescope I'm using right in then, that, that's in, in, in that, that moment. Instance, so yeah. you don't so you don't have a favorite one that you would just always grab all the time. It, it, uh, if you're going to grab something and go, the easiest thing by far is, an, is a Dobsonian telescope. You know, okay. uh, I have a four and a half inch Dobsonian telescope that is the epitome of easy to use. 
Um, the only problem I, is, is that sorry, like your favorite one? No, because I, I have to sit on the, you know, when I bought it, I could get down on my knees and bend over now I have to right. plunk down on the ground because <laughs> it's, you know, a, a, a four and a half inch, you know, is not really tall. Uh, so, um, a Newtonian, just because of the aperture that it gives you sure. and the ease of use is by yeah. far, if for just simple, easy use, that's the way to go. Okay, so last question. What do you love about working at Explore Scientific? Beer. We oh, don't no, have beer not. here. You better not say that. <laughs> Our members might think, our, our, our viewers, uh, think. Kent needs a beer. Right Kent needs a beer right now. Uh, this, uh, well, we're starting... We're starting a diet competition tomorrow. I get uh, yes, among four are. of us, so we're gonna have a little way in tomorrow. So beer is going to very rapidly leave my diet for a while. So uh, no. So the question is, um, what was the question? The question is, what do you love most about working at, at Explore Scientific? I have a hobby that pays me. I, I, I pinch myself every day, amazed that you know. The, you know, something that was just, you know, look going out, started out literally going out, sitting in the backyard and looking at for uh, um, uh, meteor showers with my dad and then uh, using binoculars and then trying to do, you know, astrophotography back in the old film days and in the late 70s and, and early 80s, uh, that that lifetime. And this it's just always been there and I've always you know, gone out and looked at the stars and mostly visual. I mean, literally eyeballs, you know, the, the Ed Gunther Mark one eyeball. Um, and that all turned out, you know, I, I grew up reading scientific. I grew up reading four magazines every month. Um, National Geographic, Reader's Digest, Scientific American and Sky and Telescope. And I read all four of those magazines, wore every single word in those magazines growing up from the time I was little. And all that information just is sort of up there. And it was just there. And I come here and it is instantly applicable, applicable to a customer service job. Uh, you went through starting with a zero base, Annie. Yeah, I had and, zero, zero knowledge. I had, you know, I had never held a telescope in my life. Yeah. And, it, and it's a challenge. I mean, there's a massive amount of stuff to learn about systems and everything else, but no idea about the math and how a telescope works and binoculars, and night vision. You know, I I've, have a hunting outdoors background, so it just fits like a glove. And I'm really, I get up every day excited to come to work. I have a hobby that pays me money to go do pinch me every day. Don't really, but you know what I mean? Well, yeah. we think you're a great asset here and we're so thankful that you are willing to host first light chronicles and um, you do a great job. And so anyway, so that is first light chronicles. So, and our host of first light chronicles, Kit Marks. Well, you should thank have you, I appreciate it. I, I try really hard. You know, we have fun here. I mean, it's a serious place to work. But, you know, everybody is friends, uh, you know, and it's just, it's just, it's been exciting to watch you go from, okay, so that's a telescope to being able to explain eyepieces and the mathematics behind them and how magnification and diameter and objective size and all those other things and walk by and hear you talking on the phone going, eh, she got it in 10 months. <laughs> she has just grown a ton. Well, I, I love watching people grow like that. That's just well, awesome. It's and you know astrophotographs too. So yeah. now she's learning astrophotography. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 A year, uh, yeah, a year I, ago, I, she couldn't spell astrophotography. Not you know, she could, whatever. She could spell it, but she 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 had no <laughs> idea what Andy it was. Is one of the best people here for grammar and yeah, study. <laughs> yes, she is. No, we, um, we, you know, it has been a great journey and uh, people having like you as, you know, I would, I would almost, I would almost say that you and Tyler and Heath have been mentors to me and teaching me. And so it's been great to have somebody around that can kind of explain things to me. And, um, even though at times Tyler and Heath would make me take tests and I finally said, I don't care. And they'd say, you, I only have a 45. And I was, then I told him I graduated with a 45. So who cares? But, you know, it's been, we have so much fun. We have so much fun here and it's great to learn um, in that type of environment. And so it's really good. It's really good. So, but yeah. 
Thank you, Annie. That's all I have. So, so next week, so ne so next week, I'll have some. I'll I'll highlight another show, um, and so we'll do that. I'm going to go through each show just so kind of our viewers know, understand uh, the focus of what each show is is about, and so. Um, and Tyler is Skyping me and telling me it has to be focused on astrophotography. We'll see, Tyler. He's last. <laughs> Dead last. last. <laughs> Dead last. We want Tyler to come on towards the end of the show time. and tell us what's on tomorrow. Ah, we start doing oh, that, yeah. Oh, yeah. yes. Okay. I need to tell him. I need to tell him that. And and yep. we need to remind him, Kent, that tomorrow's weigh-in. Yep, first thing in the morning, weigh-in. Public weigh-in, too. That's going to be the hard part. Public way in. Yeah, okay. we're gonna have to climb up on the frame over the scale so you can see how many pounds you're gonna. We, need we've actually talked about that to hold ourselves accountable. Actually, talking about on the show, but we are going to publicly weigh on the freight scales, which is uh, and there's intimidating. Four, and there's four of us. It is it is Kent, Tyler, me, and Heath. I yep. might be a little, I might be a little competitive see, when it see, comes to every him. <laughs> so you and I see you and I may have an advantage we do over Tyler because Tyler's, you know, has a has had a back thing and he can't work out. So at least other than walking, so we can go hit the gym and, and outpace him. Now, I will admit I do have 6 pounds of of small ball bearings I'm going to swallow tomorrow morning before I come to work. They're steel ball bearings, they'll just go right through me and come out in the yeah. end. Oh, I think so, I think I'm gonna have pounds of steel. I think I'm gonna have Scott check everybody's pockets before we get on. Yeah, so. No, but these are gonna be in my belly. Yeah. These aren't gonna be in my pockets. In your shoes? No, you I'm gonna eat them. You should glue them on the inside glue. of the, the sil, you know, the soles of your shoes. Yeah, carve carve out the shoes and put them in steel in the shoes. I mean, I'm not really gonna swallow ball bearings. I'm just kidding. No. Maybe. Yeah, I know. So all right, that's all, right. all I have. That's all I have. So all right thanks annie all right have fun okay hey dan are you there yep all right so this is going to yep. be interesting yes we're going to follow the slide deck i sent you yesterday so i think you've seen the slides so here we go i'm going to remember to share my sound oh heck i did the wrong thing i didn't click on the correct screen there we go all right there we go. All right. So start off with uh, welcome to On the Wings with Dan George. All right. Hey, Dan, how you doing? I tried to be as mysterious <sighs> as I can possibly be. How's the weather in uh, Colorado? Yeah. How's the weather? Got to call, call Apple later on. I, my safari does not even... Uh, hook up so it's really strange I'm getting emails but I don't have any browser so I can see that that's a beautiful five year old eagle bald eagle because of white head and white tail that's about yep. all I know Yep. alright so moving on so here we have the cardinal let me play the cardinal sound oh, I love that sound it makes you smile Okay, Dan, I always see these. I love it when a cardinal gets up in the top of a tree and the sun's shining on him and just goes to, to that spectacular song. Um, tell us about the cardinal, Dan. Well, as we have discussed many times over the last few months, to identify a bird, usually you can identify it by one of two things, either by what it looks like or by what it sounds. And each one of those is diagnostically accurate. And in the case of the Cardinal, it doesn't matter what it sounds like. You, I mean, what it sounds like, because you can see that it's a Cardinal. There's nothing like it in the United States, but the call is actually very unique to the Cardinal as well. Uh, the, this particular species, which is not, a, not seen in Colorado, unfortunately, and most of the West is eight and three quarter inches long. 
and uh, it's the male that does the calling. And in fact, I think that you have the next screen uh, shot is going to show the female. Yes, sir. Look at how, how, how little how little red you see on the female. But the oh, interesting wow. thing about the, the female cardinal is the it's almost a blood red bill or a beak, and it has a crest, but it's just a bunch of fiery red tips on that crest rather than the entire thing being uh, being uh, a red. And of course, it's got the wings and the tail that show the red. But I mean, it's an impressive. I've always told Sheldon Prowarski that I think that that bird, the, the female cardinal, is the most impressive female of all birds in North America. So let me play the female cardinal call song real quick. Just a little pip, 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 pip. Basically, does not have a call. Here's one that has sort of a call. It's let me back it just a little bit. That's a male. That chip, 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 chip is about all it does. So, just a beautiful bird. We'll go back. We'll go back and look at the male again. Come on, stop, stop. There we go. Just a beautiful bird. I love the cardinal. And then there's the female. And the cardinal male and female are about the same size, aren't they, Dan? Yes, yes, they're both eight three quarter inch. That okay. third picture you have, which is the female northern cardinal, we were talking last week about resolution by photographers that have good equipment and they know what they're looking for. You can see the, 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 the fleshy area around the eye, and you can see the, almost the cells. Yeah, it's this is. Uh, with this is another Sheldon photo. Oh, man. Uh, that is sharp. A, a sharp, dead in focus, perfect exposure. You can see, and I need to do my research on what the individual members of a feather are, but you can see the individual little pieces of the feather. You can see the 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 sharp edge of the beak. Um, like I said, around the eye, it's just astounding resolution. Um, and, and you could blow this picture up a lot more and just become amazed at the the resolution you get from using a really well, good for telescope. People, for, people that are, for people that are, let's say, fairly beginners in uh, bird watching, yeah. if, they ha if they have a binocular that they spent $39 uh, online, uh, you'd never see any of this detail. But if you if you get a, a quality, I mean, all the, a lot of those binoculars that you guys sell with Explore Scientific are so good that their resolution is almost this good. Now the real high end binoculars that are probably a thousand or more, or in some cases five hundred dollars or more, you're going to have that kind of detail. Yeah, we have a couple of binoculars that reach that. So, and they are amazing. And what are the, what are those, Scott? Those would be uh, like the Tetons from Alpen, okay, which are about $600. And then um, uh, we have had a product like the uh, uh, Bresser Montana, which were about $1,200. Um, uh, but uh, those have since been discontinued. Uh, so I would say probably right now that we're looking at those, uh, those Alpen Tetons right now. For people that want to look at birds better than, than you've ever in your life, buy the Tetons. Yeah. Spend the money. You will never, you'll never ever double question your thoughts about doing That's that. That's true. And I'll tell you the difference between a six hundred dollar pair and a, and a twelve hundred dollar pair is not very much. You know. So. You're right. You know, it, you, it's like uh, anything else. It's like when you're buying a computer, buy the biggest, baddest, fastest computer you can afford because it is going to be better than something cheaper. It's just the nature of the beast. Uh, so, uh, Cardinal, beautiful bird. We didn't talk about the range. Let's go back and talk about the range real quick. Um, Eastern United States down, swings down into Texas uh, and up into Southern Arizona a little bit, according to the range map. Uh, effectively, everything 
east of Colorado, Wyoming, Montana, uh, North Dakota, it doesn't show them. I'm sure there's some there, but otherwise the Eastern United States gets the pleasure of seeing the Northern Cardinal year round. They do not migrate. Do you have any other information there uh, on the Cardinal, Dan, before we move on? Oh, it's probably one of the most photographed birds in North America. Uh, I would say that is absolutely correct. Uh, it's a favorite of backyard feeders. It attracts easily to uh, sunflower seeds um, and, and niger seeds. And, you know, when the, when the snow's on the ground, boy, they're beautiful. Man, oh, man, they're beautiful. All right, moving along to the raucous, noisy, wonderfully obnoxious blue jay. Let's listen to the blue jay. So once you hear the Blue Jay, just like the Cardinal, Dan, you can identify it visually and you can identify it, identify it with your ear just as easily because there's yeah. nothing like it. Tell I us think, about the bird. I think, that, I think that people that are unfortunately blind could absolutely love every moment of birding by ear. And then people that, that are, uh, are, are deaf people can really get turned on to watching birds and identify them by their visual. I have a buddy of mine that I've been a birding buddy for over 30 years. And he's got really, really poor hear hearing. And he loves it when we go birding together because I have exemplary hearing and he'll pick up things that I can't pick up. And I'll of course pick up a lot of things that he can't hear. And it makes for a great duo. It's fantastic. Cool. These, this, this bird's 11 inches from the tail to the top of the top of the crest. Wow, that's a big bird. Yeah, blue jays are not small. Bird. Yep. You're um, very aggressive. You know, obviously they're blue jays because they're blue. Uh, spectacular coloration, uh, striking white and then gray on their breast and uh, the, the sides of their head. Uh, just a spectacular bird and noisy, raucous. Uh, it's like they're not intimidated by anything. They just walk around like they own the block. Uh, it's the woods is theirs, is their attitude. They have one addictive food, food source and that's peanuts. You put yes. peanuts out on the rail of your deck, you will have blue jays. Huh. You know, uh, again, sunflower seeds, they like acorns. I see them getting acorns, all sorts of stuff. Uh, the range is- oh, they say, love peanuts. <laughs> so, they love them. <laughs> now, when you say peanuts, are you talking about, you're talking about raw, in the shell or just raw out of the shell? Yes. Raw Both. in the shell. No salt. No salt. Right. Uh, when you when you feed bird stuff, you should feed the birds raw stuff, no salt, or, you know, like peanut butter, uh, you know, things like that. But uh, salt is, is bad for birds. You want to give them, you know, the raw product effectively. Um, every, everybody in the eastern United States, again, basically east of Colorado, uh, Wyoming, Montana, uh, everybody east of them, and then big push up into Canada and the eastern provinces uh, see the blue jay. And they are uh, year round. Uh, they are non breeding, scarce in the mountain states, Idaho, Montana, uh, Washington, Oregon, and a little bit down into Texas and New Mexico. They're non breeding, and it says they're scarce. Hmm. So anything else, Dan, on the Blue Jay? No, let's move to the next one, uh, All right. which is uh, one, one, of my favorite, one of my favorites. The male American goldfinch. Let's listen. I don't think I've ever seen one of those. Really? Yep. Boy, when they're in mating plumage. That was beautiful. Listen to that call. Wow. 
Warm Hughes says, an old wives' tale he heard is that if a blue jay lands in your possession, you have good luck. Good for Norm. Yeah. You know, the uh, interesting thing about the, uh, the American goldfinch, it's actually a state bird in, I think, four or five states. But it, only in breeding plumage, which be, which would mean basically from April through about uh, maybe uh, October or late September, it's going to be as canary yellow as you will see in that side that side picture to the right of it. It's even brighter. The picture that uh, that that Sheldon took here, I think, was uh, pretty pretty uh, early spring. So that color gets even more vividly yellow. And uh, the way that you identify this bird for visually, it's that it's got it's bright yellow. It's the only one that's bright yellow out there, and it has a, it has black wings. And check out that black cap. Yeah, you know, just a spectacular bird. The wing bars, the white, you know, wing bars on it, uh, the deep notch in the tail. But the giveaway is that just astoundingly flamboyant yellow and and that's why i called this show colorful because these birds are all colorful uh, the range for these birds is effectively the lower united states or all of the united states and a little bit up into all the canadian provinces um the breeding range goes up into canada uh but year round they're in the middle part of the united states and then non-breeding populations out west and in the deep, deep south. Uh, again, now, uh, go ahead. For those that are uh, our viewers right, viewers right now, compare that to the next slide. Here we go. And just assume that I'm telling you that that's, that's the identical bird minus about a month and a half. Yeah. So they, that that's plumage that's comes on. Like outside of breeding time, outside of summertime. And, and the females also have a little, they're, they're, they're not just drab little brown birds. They do have some character and color to them. I did not have a female picture or I would have put it up. But again, talking about resolution, check out the resolution in this photo. It's hard. It's easy to just sort of look at it and just admire the colors. But when you start looking at the feet and that branch, uh, and those the, the belly feathers, just astounding the detail that Sheldon has got. Dead perfect focus, depth of field of a couple of inches, just makes this end to just be a spectacular bird. So moving on. Okay, so I uh, should have a, have a contest, it would take too long. Uh, what next color for bird are we going to have? Well, We'll just go ahead and tell you the ever popular red-headed woodpecker. This is a unbelievable bird. It's nine and a quarter inches long. And uh, by the way, the, the oh, how many? I mean, she's Dan. Uh, these uh, woodpeckers. So many woodpeckers have the same sound. So it's it's not completely identifiable to hear what sound is. Why don't you play the sound of the red-headed woodpecker? Here we go. Some of these sounds sound an awful lot like, like a yellow-bellied sap sucker and a red-bellied woodpecker, a flicker. You're you're 100 correct, Kent. Uh, woodpeckers and sap suckers are almost the same. I, even though we don't have a sap sucker uh, picture here, I will tell people that there's one feature of a sap sucker that makes it a sap sucker, and I'm not going to ask you to guess on what that is. But what it is, we are looking at that bird in vertical position a sap sucker in every case has a broad white stripe on each side that goes vertical so so sometimes you'll say oh there's a woodpecker ah no 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 check out the white broad i'm talking broad like an inch inch and a half wide that goes down all the, the, the both the lateral side 
So basically straight yeah. down. If you took a, took a white magic marker and went straight down this bird's wing from, from the shoulder to the tip of the feathers. So this, this is one reason why you cannot have a favorite bird verbally. I mean, excuse me, visually, because there's so many birds that you would say, that's got to be the greatest looking bird in North America. And you know what? It's just one of a hundred of them. Check out the red on that head. Yeah. Jeez Louise. You know, and truly redhead. Right at the tip of the, of, the, uh, of the wings. It's just, it's brilliant. You know, and the big mature redhead woodpecker is just spectacular. And these are monomorphic, I believe, correct? Yes. Yeah, size wise and coloration. And the male and the female are, are indis indistinguishable. Okay, so the range again, eastern two thirds of the United States with a big question mark over Colorado and Utah, you know, so. Uh, uh, the, uh, I would say that the question marks there because somebody, somebody that's a bird watcher, uh, found one in 1985, mm -hmm. and they say we got to put a question mark there because I saw one and I know what it is. In and other you, words, that's not the ring. You're not going to find a redheaded woodpecker in Colorado, quite frankly. Yeah. So um, the key, as I keep saying, if you want to have woodpeckers, you have to have timber that draws them. Typically. For redheaded woodpeckers, standing, standing dead timber. Um, you know, many woodpeckers don't have to have dead timber, but uh, woodpeckers, you know, the redhead woodpecker is one that that is benefited from uh, standing dead timber. Uh, so just the standing, a, dead, the standing dead timber timber attracts in insects and their insect uh, insect eaters. Right. And they also give them a place to hollow out a big nest because they are cavity nesters. And, you know, to fit a, what was it, nine and a half, nine and three quarters of an inch bird into a log, you've got to have a pretty good sized cavity. Yeah. You know, to fit, right. To, to fit that bird in there and, you know, have a clutch of eggs, two, three, four, five other bir baby birds that grow up in there. So um, that's bird number four. And the male eastern bluebird, you know, in the right sunlight, these are gloriously illuminated birds. Um, here we go. Listen real quick. You can always you can always identify any of the three species of uh, of bluebirds in the United States by turning the treble down on your sound and focusing almost all on the baritone and bass sound. It's kind of a low sound, and when you hear that, you say, "Ah, there's a bluebird somewhere," because they make that sound that's totally different than all the other birds. So you say three species: and, eastern, eastern, western, and mountain. Yes. Okay. Eastern, Western, so and Mountain maybe, Bluebird. Uh, maybe next, maybe next year when we kick off uh, uh, in springtime, we can uh, have a, a a day of just the three. Uh, and there's uh, there's relatives to the the bluebird as well, Townsend solitaire, solitaire for example. But anyway, this is a spectacular bird, and and it only goes basically to the middle of the country, and when once you get to the middle of the country you would then see its counterpart or its cousin, the uh, Western bluebird. And the nice color of blue on the, on that, the pattern on its wing, that becomes the color they have on their chin and their breast is that blue. And that makes it the Western. Hmm. And what's the mountain look like? The mountain is all powder blue. It's beautiful. You need to look at when you have nothing else to do. Go, and, go on your browser. Look at what a mountain bluebird is. And if you were to get the call, it would be very similar to the Eastern and the Western Bluebird. Just, you know, the, 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 what would you call it? Rust, red, ru ruddy, ruddy color? On rusty, the I'd, say, I'd say rusty, but yeah. 
that works. Yeah, just a beautiful bird. Uh, they favor, you know, open areas. Uh, I see them uh, at my son's farm all the time. Um, you know, they feed on, well, fly down and catch things in the in the grass, uh, fly around and pick things out of the air. It's fun to watch them, you know, do their thing and 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 feed their clutches and feed themselves. Uh, just a beautiful the female, bird. The female eastern bluebird is almost all grayish mm-hmm. and almost no, almost no blue at all. And I, right. would, I would recommend I would recommend anybody that would like to attract these to their backyard to put a bluebird box up. But they need to have. There's a. I think they like to face north or south. There's there's all sorts of plans online to build them, but there's orientations. No, I, that, I, believe, I believe it. The, the hole needs to face south, and also the hole uh, has to be a specific. Uh, like an inch and three quarters or something. I'm not a, no more than that. But you have to look at. I can't remember exactly what it is. Check it out. Yeah. You can find out exactly what a bluebird box needs to be. And I would just simply buy one that's that's a bluebird box, and you can yeah. get it. You know, uh, uh, various retail places. If you're handy with lumber, there's plans out there to use a, a cedar fence post, not a fence post, but a cedar uh, plank to make a bluebird house out of, of Western red cedar or Eastern red cedar. And, uh, that's, you know, the, that's correct. The, the whole size is critical because if it's too big, it lets in sparrows. And if it's too that's small, they can't get in. So there's a critical size. That, darn sparrows anywhere close to bluebirds. Yeah. Uh, we have one and a half inches. Heath, Heath has Go ahead. one and a half inches, Scott. Yep. Heath has pictures oh, okay. of, of oh, some bluebirds in his backyard. I need to play that video sometime uh, that he has of uh, bluebirds chasing off sparrows that are sort of trying to hang around the house and, you know, the bluebird house that he has up in his, in his backyard. Um, but they but like... That put bluebird, bluebird boxes in your backyard. Just don't put them like 10 feet from the house. You know, put them, put them a little bit further away so they're not scared for people. And you'll also find that bluebird boxes will attract uh, swallows in springtime. And, and swallows are gorgeous. They're beautiful. But there's other birds besides bluebirds that are going to use a bluebird box. You know, house finches, uh, not house finches, but uh, house wrens, no, no, Carolina no. wrens. Yeah, I see wrens in them sometimes. Oh, well, house finches will build a nest with, you know, yeah. twigs. All right. So here we go. Beautiful bird. And on. Okay, so we've been talking about the male purple finch or uh purple house or purple finch or house finch you know these are photos by sheldon uh thought we'd spend a little time discussing the difference um this is a difficult bird uh to identify so uh dan go down your list for the house finch i'm going to slide up and as you go along i will step through what we're talking about okay well we have uh we have on the left there is oh my god i mean when I, i've been in places where both of these birds exist and when they're when they're in the same area it's almost impossible uh, especially if you're looking at females but the uh the house finch has a brown crown if you could see the bird from the top it's, a lot of times you'd be able to i believe the one on the right if you look real close because it's high definition from Sheldon, you, you see the beginning of a brownish crown. And as, as w- weird as it is, that's a distinguishing ca- characteristic. The bird on the left is like the purple finches, which has rose red virtually everywhere on its head and it's under the chin and the breast and then throughout the streaked body. Whereas the house finch doesn't, once you have, once you're beyond the red, of a little bit underneath the chin on the male, then it's basically just streaked with, uh, you know, whitish, grayish with streaks. So, and also the, uh, the house finch actually has two wing bars. If you see uh, the one on the right, it's kind of, kind of hard to see in this one, but there's one prominent wing bar that's white and then the feathers will form another one uh, further down. But the one on the left, even though it looks like it's a white wing bar, it's not really a white wing bar. The purple finch does not have wing bars. So therein lies, by the way, 
the differences between these two, and it's uh, it's okay if you don't really follow this conversation because a lot of birders can't comp- can, can't c- compare the two of them uh, if they're in the same tree. All right, and so the females, house finch, are similar to the males, but they lack the red coloration, and they have light underside streaking. And also, the female is is lightly streaked on the um, underneath, whereas the uh, purple finch female is heavily streaked. And that is, these are these are true identifiers. All right, so. Um, Let's talk about the uh, the range is the 48 U.S. states and southern Canadian provinces. So um, moving on to the purple finch, it's also six inches long. So size-wise, they're the same bird. So what else? Define the male for us. Uh, uh, the, the pur- okay, the purple finch is basically a rosy red rather than an orangey red. So, in other words, it's a little bit deeper color of red, and of course, we know that's subjective. And it is the purple finch has rosy red all over its head and crown, and throughout the streaking of its breast. So it's fully a colorful male bird, no wing bars, and the crown is also rose red. So I can actually thank Kent for adding this particular bird on today's program because I, when he said, I'd like to do the purple finch, I said, you've got to be crazy. Most birders don't even know the difference. Well, it's because if you're not living in an area where the purple finch lives, like in, like in this particular case, if you're in about eight or nine states, you'll never see them. But when, where you guys are in Arkansas and then the great West, uh, excuse me, uh, in, um, you guys in Arkansas will have will have both of them, and then you got to go way far up to to uh, Puget Sound, Washington, Oregon, Northern California, and then you might see one, but it, you might see one, which is very hard hard to uh, hard to predict. So I've got right now. I've gone to the comparison range side by side with the house finch range on the left and the purple finch range on the right. And there are some marked differences. Uh, you know, the, the house finch range includes the four corners uh, states, uh, Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, and Utah, and a little push up into uh, uh, Wyoming and Montana, and then all out to the West Coast. Whereas that area for the purple finch range is almost non-existent, they don't exist there. And so you're looking at a situation where if you're in that area and see one of these purple birds, you know, the four quarter states up into to, um, Wyoming and Montana, you're almost assuredly looking at a house finch. But once you get uh, to the Iowa, uh, Nebraska, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Missouri, Wisconsin area, that's where the overlap all the way across the eastern area of the United States goes. And uh, so it, it's it's a challenge because if you live in those areas where their range overlaps, you've got to study these birds significantly to be able to see the difference in them. And so, Kent, um, do you have Kent, do you have the call of the I do of these two birds? I do. So here goes the house finch. Okay, very common for most people. Let's listen to the purple the last, finch. The last sound that it makes is diagnostic house finch. That, that, that very last one, it, it, it kind of ends with it. It's like a wheeze sound. So here goes the, here's the purple finch. Much more sing song. Much more of a song. Absolutely. More melodical. So so the diagnostic sound difference is, if it's a purple finch, it's a melodious song. 
that has some length to it. And if it's a house finch, it just sort of chirps. Uh, you know, right in the middle of uh, breeding season for house finch, which is the most common backyard bird here in Colorado, um, you get you start hearing that. It, it really is a melodious sound, but it is not as full full featured as the uh, the purple. The purple is really pretty be beautiful. So there, from that standpoint, that's probably the biggest comparison difference between the two birds is what their call is. We're listening to it again, the purple. That wasn't it. So, you know, the song is the, is the, becomes the diagnostic tool of choice. Yes. Right, but if so, you start looking at females, you might as well forget it. And so we come to the end with another non-bird. It's a damselfly, which generically I would just always call this a dragonfly, but it's an ebony jewel-winged damselfly. And just yeah. on a, uh, looks like an elm tree sort of looking, I think, but just a magnificent uh, insect, just dynamic color. So, all right. So next week we're going to have drab birds. Now drab birds have beauty all their own. Um, and you'll get, gonna, we're going to have one bird that was in today's slide that is also going to be in the drab burn slide. I won't tell you what it is, but, uh, we saw a bird today. We're going to see it again next week. And it's the same bird, same species, but it is just, it has some color to it, but it's drab. And I'm just going to leave it at that. So we're going to do drab birds next week. So, um, and Dan, you have an announcement to make. Uh, you're going to be taking the winter off, correct? Yeah, taking a break. Um, looking forward to coming back uh, in the springtime, maybe the end of March when, uh, when Kent will be even a full-fledged bird watcher because of, of, of the breeding season and migration is crazy, where the male of most species is crazy and wonderful to see. Uh, but kicking it off at that time will be fantastic and it'll be exciting for all of those that, that tune in. So uh, I'm going to keep the show going. Uh, going to going to try and change it up a little bit. I'm working on some uh, getting in some guests uh, with some expertise in, in specific areas. Um, I don't want to uh, let a cat out of a bag, but um, in two weeks, I may have a very interesting guest on. Uh, and we also have another show coming up of reader submitted birds. Uh, so if you've got pictures, um, I've got a couple of people that are sending me pictures regularly from, from California. I'd love to get pictures from other parts of the United States. So, uh, and of the world, I'm going to have some pictures from Pekka. Norm uh, Hughes from, sent from, in some pictures. Just, uh, so, sir? Like, Norm Hughes just sent in some photos. Excellent. Okay, uh, good. Thank you, Norm. Yeah. And I've got some from Pekka as well from uh, Go International a little bit. Uh, and and get some uh, and one of your uh, some European sparrows, which I know that um, um, Dan would just dearly love to tune in and watch because he loves him himself some sparrows, <laughs> don't you, Dan? <laughs> all sparrows all the time on the he, Sparrow Channel. He, he actually, <laughs> as long as they're not house sparrows. He's down with them, but house sparrows, he didn't want to party with house sparrows. So anyway, got some cool things coming up, working on some guests and uh, um, trying to uh, we'll be filling in and, and, and modify the format a little bit at that point. Uh, so Dan, I've really enjoyed doing these shows with you. I am going to miss you for the next few months uh, and look forward to seeing you uh, migrate back in uh, in the spring to the show. Uh, to join us during. I look forward to it. Very and and I'm going to consult with you on birds. You can't escape email. Uh, I hope 
So I, if I have some birds I'm unsure of, I'm going to uh, bounce on, lean on you for your expertise. So just because you're not on the show doesn't mean you're not going to have a hand in it. We, and I appreciate what you've done I, for us. Thank you. I love the, I love every one of those challenges. I mean, seriously. Just, just don't send me a house sparrow mail. <laughs> it, okay, here's what's going to happen. I, I do that just to hear Scott laugh. <laughs> okay. So Heath is going his 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 sparrow trap is working. He's going to get one, so and the the whole point of them is to dispatch them of their earthly ties, and and I may dehydrate one and mail it to you just so you have it Aww, for your your on. collection. That's really I am just uh, I I'm I'm humbled because I know God created it for a reason, and someday I'm going to ask Him why. But uh, yeah, when you get up to the pearly gaze uh, and, and he's standing there and he's going, now, what do you got against? <laughs> he, he, the thing is, he, he invented house sparrows for England. He didn't invent house sparrows for the United States. Ah, I see. That's what it is. Yeah. So. All right. So it looks like Tyler has snuck Tyler's in with us. He's been hanging out, yeah. working in the background. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. There's Tyler. Everybody look at Tyler and laugh at how goofy he looks. Yeah. <laughs> doesn't bother me. Doesn't yeah. bother me. And, and the, the weird thing is, he shaved yesterday. Yeah. Clean so, shaven, huh? Yeah. Yeah. So, anyway, Tyler, you've got a show coming up tomorrow. Focus on astrophotography. Yes, sir. Um, what are you looking at? Well, believe it or not, we got a great, great show in line for tomorrow. We have a very special guest who is an Explorer Alliance ambassador member. Uh, Jason Genzel. Um, if people know who Jason Genzel is, he's also an Instagram. Uh, uh, what, what would be the word? He's the on his, yeah. Is his handle. Yeah. yeah, the vast reaches is his handle on Instagram. Uh, he's well known for solar imaging as far as planetary and with deep sky objects. Um, I personally like his, his planetary and his solar imaging because he uses a dar 152 on his solar and he brings out so much detail with that thing it's unreal uh and we'll be also talking about deep sky astrophotography what a bit what a beginner needs to do to get that image that he's wanting to get or that he sees on everybody else's page but he's not able to get it quite just yet so we're going to help him figure out What's the best approach with a DSLR or a dedicated astronomy camera or just helping with either or as far as what gain and ISO to use. So make sure you turn in, tune in at four o'clock Central Standard Time. <laughs> yes. Uh, Everybody go to bed. It's, it's bedtime. Um, four o'clock Central Standard Time this Friday. Um, so so uh, to point this out, he's using a, using a big telescope, mm -hmm. but it's under $1,000. It's oh, not like he's... Yeah. He's, he's not using a five or ten thousand dollar telescope. Oh, he's using a doublet. He's using our uh, AR one fifty two doublet, and he's produces amazing images with solar. Yeah, uh, yeah, amazing. Uh, really, really amazing granular detail for sure. Yes. So, but we're going to go over that tomorrow. That's that's what, what I got time? for y'all. What time? Four o'clock. Four o'clock Central. Central Standard Time. No. Daylight time. Daylight time. Yeah. For another week. Yeah, uh, I think we roll Is daylight next? savings time ends in the United States November the 8th, 8th or 9th or something like that. Mm. I'll look it up real quick. The beautiful thing about the internet is if you have a question and don't immediately look it up, it's your own fault. So uh, I think it's the next week. November the 7th. So next the week. night of the 6th, the, the morning of the 7th, we fall back and mm. uh, move our clocks back an hour. So It'll be sunny when we get up now and dark when we go home at five o'clock or five thirty or whenever we go home. So we go home. We we do go home periodically. Scott keeps me here all the time. I yeah. don't know. He, he, he changed you to your desk and makes you work. Yeah. So anyway, and, and Tyler, we announced our little weight loss uh, program tomorrow. Uh -huh. That's right. And, uh, yeah. So, yeah. 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 So, so Ken's been cheating by eating 10 cheeseburgers and uh, two cases of beer actually, every night. Okay. Actually, Heath has, actually has been cheating and eating cheeseburgers <laughs> and french fries and fried chicken for the last he's four Yeah, up, he huh? has. He's both, yeah, he's, so he can just eat normal uh, and lose weight. Uh, yeah. Our poor audiences. Yeah, Tyler has, Tyler has, Tyler has had a little, little, uh, little back problem and mm -hmm. 
he can't go to the gym and work out. So get on a he, treadmill. He's gonna have get to, on the treadmill. That's if right. he's gonna win, he's gonna have to starve himself and, and just sauna. walk his way. He can get in a sauna. Yeah, I'll put we him just, on a ten day fast, and he'll he'll, he'll drop that way. I'm not doing yeah. the cayenne pepper and lemon juice. I ain't doing it. <laughs> I told you I'm I'm I'm, I'm eating eight pounds of uh of ball bearings t- tonight. I'm gonna have oh, steel. Man. Yeah. So anyway, yeah. Just that. All right. <laughs> uh, not really. Audience. I'm not really going to do it. Poor I, audience. I swear. Poor audience. So, but it's and, and, and there's money involved in there, Tyler. I don't know what the prizes are. Yeah. I don't have any idea. So I'm just been, doing it because I need to get healthy. So this is a two month weight loss. And anybody wants to join us, feel free to join us. What we're doing is we're going to weigh in on, on the, the when we come back after the, the New Year's holiday. Mm-hmm. And weigh again on the freight scale. Well, we're in the same clothes we're wearing the day we weigh in tomorrow. And uh, uh, whoever has lost the most percentage wins half the pot. And then whoever has gained the least <laughs> on June the 1st or lost more, whichever, however it goes, whoever's been the most successful taking off more or keeping it off is going to get the other half the pot. And it's like I think five dollars to get in. So there's a you know, there's a you know twenty dollars at stake overall. So I mean that's just a really a reason to uh to uh to participate. Yeah. So, make me spend you know, money. Every, everybody you know, everybody join us. Now's the time. And, and Heath was like, no, let's wait till after the holidays. And I'm like, no. Yeah. Actually, that was Tyler. And yeah. I was like, no, no, now's the perfect time to go on a diet no. and force ourselves. No. To not put on the the uh, the holiday fifty or whatever twenty years. Oh, or whatever it is. Man. I like yep. turkey. I like turkey, turkey and too. ham. The problem is I like dressing <laughs> and cranberry sauce and pie, pumpkin, apple, cherry. Uh, let's see, corn. I like corn. Uh, green beans. You know, you start you just name it. If it doesn't have coconut on it, I'm probably going to eat it for Thanksgiving. It's going to be well, hard on me. So please, anyway. I, I, think Carol, I think Carol Locke has already won. He says he started at, uh, the COVID at 210. Now he's 178. Wow. That's pretty wow. good. That's and, that's the E. And did he do it that's without getting good. COVID? You know, doing it without getting COVID. Yeah, that's, they were yeah. cl- calling it the quarantine 15, you know, where you gain 15 pounds. <laughs> yeah. Right? I gained, I gained 30. So you did two quarantines, right? Yeah, sure. I'll go with that. Yeah, yeah, go with that. Go with that. All right. All right, guys. Well, uh, to the audience, um, we will uh, we will wish you all, uh, you know, a great night. And uh, we'll see you tomorrow uh, for Focus on Astrophotography. And, um, and you know, until that time, you guys keep looking up. And we'll see you later. Why do we chase this thing? 
jumping from one continent to the next, just to bathe for a moment in the absence of light. Who are we? What are we searching for? T.S. Eliot wrote, we shall not cease from exploration and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. One of the qualities of seeing an eclipse is it makes you understand that every given thing is in a particular patterned relation with every other thing. It gives me a sense of scale. It gives me a sense of where I fit into the universe. It is his art, his poetry. It's this kind of experience of going and, and seeing totality in which what feels merely metaphorical is suddenly experiential encounter. Immediately afterwards, you have that overwhelming desire to see another one. That's the moment an eclipse chaser is born. These are folks who are running all over the world for this event that lasts all of two or three minutes. Who are these people? It's unique each time. And therefore that freshness, even if we've seen it over and over again, oh my gosh, it has the potential to re-inspire us. A total eclipse of the sun doesn't just unfold in the heavens. It transforms the minds and hearts of those who experience it firsthand. The same is true of journeys to the most remote regions of our planet. Whether we're standing on a mountain peak or in a stark polar landscape, we can't help but reflect on our place within the larger scheme of things.